Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder of Retzel and Andrus and leader of our healthcare practice, and very excited to introduce everyone to Jonna Eimer. Some people listening may be familiar with her. She has recently joined our healthcare practice uh, as a partner at Retzel and Andrus as well. And today, she's going to be sharing some of her expertise on the topic of management service organization. Now, this is a hot topic, and we've covered it before on our podcast. It it is still the number one topic that I get emails and calls about based on our podcast. So I thought it would be very timely to discuss this with John, who does a lot of work in this area. And also because she's just recently updated her article called Management Services Organization Checklist with LexisNexis. And she did an amazing job summarizing it. Um, and so I thought it would be a good time for us to talk through it. So, so glad you're here, Jonna. Thank and you. And welcome. Glad to be here. This is definitely a timely topic. Yes, and the first of many podcasts I'll probably drag you on to. So, um, all right, so you and I both use MSOs quite a lot, and we're using the word MSO generically to mean management service organizations, but lots of different uh, specialties use it, dentists use it, and they call it a DSO, right? So an MSO really is just a management entity that allows non-licensed people to participate in management of a professional entity. And um, it's very common. We use it for little med spot type deals and private equity uses it for large transaction. It is a very common structure. So I kind of want to start by having you explain to everyone, why is this even a, a structure that needs to be used, you know, and does it need to be used in every state? Well, thanks for that intro. And like you said, they are very commonly used these days in big deals, small deals, you name it, everybody wants to use a management services organization. And the reason we need them and the reason this model is utilized is what you said before is because these non-licensed professionals wanted to get into the investment game and the healthcare business, right, enterprise side of things. So in order to do that, because there's various rules restrict, restricting non-professionals from owning a professional practice. So the corporate practice of medicine is a rule that many states follow that basically restricts these non-doctors from owning a doctor entity. Or like you said, it could be a dentist, it could be behavioral health, it could be veterinarian. Um, all these, these licensed areas require the licensed professional to actually own the entity. So for these non-licensed professionals to get into the area, they need to employ this management services organization structure, which basically bifurcates the clinical and non-clinical side of the business, right? So all the clinical side, all the clinical part of the clinical decision-making, professional judgment, medical decisions, that remains with the professional practice. But the other stuff, the stuff that is non-clinical, that can all stay in the management organization. So anything like HR, billing, um, Anything that you, you know, compliance, things that don't really have to do with the practice of medicine or practice of the professional license that we're dealing with, that can be in the management side of things. Exactly. And some places or, or some structures go even further. So uh, the MSO might be the one that um, owns the space or rents the space mm -hmm. and the equipment. And through the management agreement with the professional entity is providing it. So just so everybody listening understand, when the MSO provides all these things to the professional entity, professional entity then has to pay a fee and that's a management fee. And, and this is the way the money gets pulled up to the management entity where just about anybody could be an owner. It's a business entity that can be owned by anyone. So it is kind of a unique um, but very workable approach. Um, however, there are some limitations which we'll discuss 
because a lot of people try and set them up and they don't even think about whether the law in their particular state might apply, right? And I want to point out that there are some states where they don't really care who owns the entity, right? So you can have non-doctor or non-professional owners employing the licensed people or they could co-own it together. So to us, that's strange because we're here in Illinois, right? And most states are like, like us, but you know, Ohio, for example, um, you know, they're much more flexible like that. I don't know. Do you think, which way do you think is better? Um, I, I see the value in both, but it definitely is state specific. So whenever you're employing this model, you have to look at the state laws where you're practicing to see what they allow the professional and non-professional to do. I see the public policy considerations behind restricting access to these professional entities, right? We want the professional decision-making and medical decisions to be with the professional, with the doctor. We don't want some non-doctor, you know, doctor, non-professional making a decision about how long to see us or what kind of care we get, right? So I, I see the rule, the reasons for restricting it, um, but I also see the benefit to having professional managers and people run a practice so the doctors and the professionals and the dentists can focus on their practice instead of the business of, of whatever it is, medicine or dentistry or whatever else. So I, I see both things. And like you said, it's highly regulated. It's highly regulated at the federal level, but then at the state level. And so there's state rules that, like you said, in certain places are very restrictive with the corporate practice of medicine and similar laws in some places are looser. Um, I usually find that the looser places are places that need probably licensed professionals more. So they really are trying to attract and, and do more healthcare entities in that state. So they've had to be a little more lax where a lot of states like Illinois and New York, where they have a lot of professionals um, and, and they're an abundant of these licensed professionals, they might have more restrictive rules on the practice because they can. But like you said, even the management fee. So the management fee is how you pay your management entity. And that also is a high, highly regulated, as you know very well, er, uh, area, right. that it's, it's, it's state specific as well. And how that management fee can be applied in the methodology and what approach you can use, that you have to look at the state, where some states like Illinois really don't allow a, per, a percentage of revenue approach in a management agreement, but they have an exception for billing. Other states like California are more lenient and they'll allow a percentage approach. So you really have to look at each state to see even with the management fee, is it is the type of methodology you're using allowed in the state? Is it fair market value? Is it set in advance? We want to make sure that this fee is never related to the value or volume of referrals. Um, and so you're always and that's being... for, for federal law, just so yes. clear, yes. right? Yes. So if you have a business, then yes. some of that fair market value stuff goes into play yes, as well. Absolutely. But there's a lot of, as you know, corresponding and parallel state laws and fee splitting right. laws that come into play. So you're always going back and forth between the federal and the state to see mm -hmm. what area you're implicating because you have to be so careful and they're ever in flux. They're changing all the time. There's new cases, new regulations, new alerts that tell us what or what not is allowed these days. Right. Um, that's a great point. And we are continuing to see changes. So um, you and I were talking before this podcast, and I was mentioning that in many states starting in January, uh, there's some new state level laws that are now requiring review of all healthcare mm -hmm. transactions. So mm -hmm. some of the reasons that people use MSOs have to do with um, acquiring a business, acquiring a practice. It's very popular with private equity. In fact, it's the structure we always use in mm -hmm. private equity deals. And now those type of transactions, even if they're set up perfectly with all the elements we just discussed and they comply mm -hmm. with those requirements, now these type of transactions are gonna be reviewed. So every you need to continuously look at your state and see what the changes are that, that may impact them. Yeah. And one other thing I wanna mention is that even though, as you point out, there are some states where they don't have fee splitting or they don't have other requirements, such as corporate practice of medicine, for some reason, this is still a really popular approach. And, you know, the reason for that is that if you're going in many different states, you don't want to have a different approach in different states. So it's for consistency. And also the idea of centralizing services is not a bad one. I mean, most businesses kind of centralize their assets or their administrative and management services. The healthcare industry is a little late to the game, but it actually is a good approach. And it really does create some 
cost saving uh, and some efficiencies. So I think, you know, it's here to stay for sure. And mm -hmm. if there's changes in the law, we'll really just kind of be adapting to them. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely agree? feel like you, that's right, the so calls I get most of the time are about MSOs, but yeah, you have to always be cognizant of these ever-changing rules and laws. Do you want to take us through the document? So if somebody calls you and tells you about a deal they want to do, for example, let's say they want to uh, set up a med spa and you have an individual who themselves is not a doctor, but let's say they're a licensed mm -hmm. nurse practitioner. So, and this is a question I get very often, which is kind of mm -hmm. why I'm using this scenario. What would be the steps involved that you need to think about? And what are the documents that would need to be created? Yeah. Well, like like you, where I'm practicing in, in Illinois, uh, the new the newer laws allow the nurse practitioners with independent practice authority to establish these med spots. So this has been great and opened up a whole area of business for independent practice nurse practitioners. Um, but those, again, like you know, and I know, are state specific. Can the nurse practitioner, the advanced practice nurse in any given state practice independently? In Illinois now, we can with certain, you know, rules, if certain rules and study requirements are met. So if someone like that approaches me and say they want to do a med spa, so then I would help them form first the professional entity. So in that case, it be the nurse practitioner practice entity, the professional practice, we would set that up. Typically, I, I my favorite approach is usually the professional limited liability company. But that, again, is state specific. If you're in California, for instance, you can't do an LLC. You have to do a professional corp. So again, even the entity type it can be driven by where you're, you're located. So then first, if she was in Illinois, I would probably steer her toward a professional LLC and we'd form the entity. And then then she would we would be setting up whether or not she wants to do the MSO structure or not, because she's a she's a licensed professional. So she doesn't need it. It would be as if she if she has outside investors who are non licensed professionals or business people or business investors, someone else who's a non licensed professional who wants into the business and she wants to share it. So then I'd say, well, in that case, we should think about the management services organization structure. If you have outside investors who are non clinicians, we can give them ownership at this MSO level. And maybe you also own that, or maybe it's just them. It depends on where the equity and, and where the capital is coming from, how we structure it. And then we'd set up, as you know, a management services agreement, which would govern that relationship between the professional practice and the MSO. And the, in that document, it would also go through the fees like we talked about before. So that's usually where I would start. Right. Right. I totally agree. Um, a couple of other thoughts would be that if, for example, this is someone in a state where she can't form the entity, then typically she's going to have to find or he's going to have to find a doctor. And so what you would do is form that entity with the doctor owning it. And the doctor really, if the doctor needs to provide supervision, then the doctor actually has to provide supervision. I think a lot of people just think they can hire a token doctor to be the yeah. owner or friendly physician and the yeah. doctor doesn't need to be involved. And I think doctors especially need to be very careful because they could be violating their own practice act. Uh, but yeah. it's very common to then have some agreement with the doctor spelling out their involvement and, and what they're getting compensated. Even though they own the entity, they're only going to get paid you know, for what's agreed upon. And then on the other end of things, and I know you're very involved with this piece, is once you know who's going to own the MSO, there needs to be an agreement among those owners uh, in terms of, you know, how they make decisions, uh, how they value the practice, uh, how they, you know, share revenue that's coming in, et cetera. So, um, so when we are asked to do this, people have to understand there is an evaluation of state and federal law. There are a couple of different entities, at least, to be formed, sometimes more complicated structures, right? And then um, there are numerous documents that are involved. If you're doing it properly, um, right. this is really the way it needs to be done. And, and the idea would be to prevent later misunderstandings or noncompliance. 
Yeah. And I agree. Like, right. like you, I think a lot of people call me and probably call you the same way. And you have this non-professional who wants to get into the healthcare game and they, they're like, oh, we'll just find a doctor and make them a medical director or him or her a medical director. That'll be fine. Right. We'll just, and, and, you know, no, no, no. And, and, or the medical director, the doctor will call me and say, Hey, I'm going to be a medical director. It's no big deal. I'll just sign off on all this stuff. And you have to kind of slow them down and say, okay, but listen, you, you will own the professional practice. Like this is your license on the line you or or you're contributing to the illegal practice of medicine if you're not really involved you can't just sit from afar and put your name on stuff you have real liability and exposure and it's really is your name and your license that is is at risk if you don't do it correctly but yeah I think like you a lot of people just kind of think it's real quick and the doctor wants some extra money and the and the med spa wants to get going and, and then we have to be the bad guys right. that say, slow down, slow down. Let's talk about this. And I think what you said too is really important because people will say, you said it has to be done properly. And so often people will call me and say, well, I know so-and-so and they have a med spot and they don't do it this way. And unfortunately, a lot of people <laughs> don't do it the right way. And they'll say, well, nothing happened. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I, I, if you want to live like that, I can't. I can't advise you that way. I mean, a lot of small practices and med spas may not, they may go under the radar, right? Maybe nobody knows, maybe nobody audits them. But um, you may, and, and I certainly wouldn't want to live like that with that risk. And also we're talking about medicine and healthcare. If you really are injecting people or, or practicing medicine, even if it's a med spa, there's real risk and real liability. Um, so you definitely have to analyze these with the professionals and the non-professionals alike to make sure they're done carefully and correctly. Right. I think those are great points. And a couple of other things I want to mention is that for doctors that think they're just doing this on the side to make extra money, they need to be aware that there's a limit on the number of people that they can supervise in most states or collaborate with. And also they need to make sure that they also have malpractice coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they've got a full-time job and they're doing this as a side gig, you know, they could still be liable for advice they're giving, et cetera. Right. The other thing is that most states have laws regarding physician uh, supervision or other professional type of supervision. And they require that that person who's supervising be active in their practice and that they um, have expertise in the area that they're supervising. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you're like a cardiologist, yeah, if you're a cardiologist and you're being asked, you know, you're by your neighbor to just kind of be their doctor friendly physician and, and you're supposed to be overseeing people who are doing injections and you yourself never mm -hmm. done it, don't know anything about it. How are you going to know if a patient is a proper candidate? Mm -hmm. How do you know what the protocol should be that you're overseeing? So I, I think doctors sometimes are really need to give it a little bit of extra thought and mm -hmm. to you know, not just sign off on stop before talking to their lawyer. And yeah, yeah, I completely I tell you, agree. There are plenty of that. Yeah, there are so many entities out there um, that are doing med spas that are formed as business entities uh, mm -hmm. that don't have licenses in their particular state, yeah. um, and they just have a doctor to be a medical director, as you mentioned earlier, and yeah. you know. They they just haven't gotten caught yet, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. But certainly, we we only advise the correct way to do it, right? Right. And we don't want to hear. It. Yeah. And, and like what you said, you <laughs> can't have, or you shouldn't have, I should say, uh, a non-cosmetic, like an anesthesiologist supervising Botox. They still are governed by their scope of practice. So I always say, well, if that is not what you normally do, and you do not have training in this area, that is not something that you within your scope of practice can do. And your malpractice may not even cover it. Um, so there's a lot of things that you need to be mindful of as the professional and your license at stake. So it's, it's a big deal, especially to do this as a side gig to make a few extra dollars and, and, and you've, you know, potentially risked your whole livelihood. Right. And that's a really good point. So in addition to the supervision of services, when physicians act or other professionals act as the owner of that entity, there's other liability risk as well. Right. So they are assuming that they're just owning it in name only. Right. And that everything is being taken care of by the MSO. But if the MSO doesn't pay its vendors that are providing items or services to the practice or doesn't pay the taxes for the practice. Don't forget, a lot of money's coming in and it's flowing up to the management <laughs> arm and the doctor yeah. getting 
paltry amount, maybe, you know, or just his employment amount, um, you know, and they don't pay their taxes, guess who owns the entity, right? So in terms of liability protection, friendly physicians also need to make sure that the documents indemnify them and hold, you know, that MSO uh, mm -hmm. responsible for those amounts. Now, an MSO can go out of business, by the way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then the doctor still owns that entity. So there's lots of things to talk about with your lawyer. You're on either side of a potential yeah. Yeah. MSO deal. It's a great option, but requires mm -hmm. some planning. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And like you, I've been on both sides, right? Sometimes you're the med spa or, or the, you know, the private equity side or whatever. And other times you're the clinician side and they're just like, oh, it's just easy money. And, and there's different risks and worries on, on each that you have to be mindful of. Right. Exactly. Boy, this is a topic that we could really cover quite extensively. Um, but I think those are the items that I really wanted us to kind of get out there. So if anyone is thinking of of setting up an MSO, a DSO or equivalent, uh, whether they are the licensed person wanting to get involved or the non-licensed person wanting to get involved, there are a lot of things to think about. There are documents you need. There's research about the state that you're in. Um, so we hope that you've learned a little bit of something here listening to us and we welcome you to contact either one of us with questions that you may have. You know, can email or call either one of us. Any final words that you wanna share? No, I just echo your sentiments. It's a big growing area of law. It's very exciting. You and I both get a lot of calls about this. So so yeah, feel free to reach out to either of us. And, and thank you so much for having me. This is great. Yeah, it's been great. And you'll see Jonna again. This is the Health Law Hotspot. And you can catch our other podcasts at ralaw.com. Thanks for joining us. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.